Hi guys, Drew from Aloha Plant Life here and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be covering Ficus elastica care, also known more commonly as a rubber plant or a rubber tree. And this is my ruby Ficus elastica, variegated, beautiful version of this plant with that kind of ruby-ish coloring to those leaves. Absolutely love this little girl. And this plant I find to be relatively easy. You know, I feel like I say this about every plant that I do these care videos for, but the whole reason I'm doing these care videos is, well, two reasons. One, sometimes it's not easy for everybody. What's easy for me may not be easy for you and vice versa. But also some of us just get plants for the first time. We've never had a ficus elastica before and we just don't know what to do with it. So I just wanna get this information out there for you guys so that you can be set up for success from the get-go with your ficus elasticas when you finally get one. So let's go ahead and talk about the growth patterns. So these are trees. This will get very large eventually. They're relatively fast growers, but not super fast in my experience. So it's gonna be a while before you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have room for this thing anymore. But you can buy them relatively small. I bought ruby hair as just a little four inch plant, or you can find them relatively large at some nurseries as well. But just remember that eventually it will get bigger. So you may have to find several different places over the course of its life for it to live in your home. Now, most often when you buy a ficus elastica, it's gonna be a single stemmed plant like ruby is right now. Sometimes if you're buying a more mature plant, you might be able to find one that has multiple branches on it at your local plant store. But don't worry if it is just one single stem because you actually have multiple ways that you can force it to branch. And I have created a video in the past that explains all of those ways and takes you step by step through my preferred method, which is notching. And I will link that video at the end of this video for you, as well as in the description down below if you need to go check that out. But you may want to keep it as a single stem. There's no reason that you can't. If you have a very narrow space that you need to put it in, by all means, leave it as one single stem. It's still a beautiful plant. So let's talk about lighting. So this plant wants a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of bright, bright light. Now, most people will tell you bright indirect light. I have mine both living in Southern facing windows, directly in the windows. They get a lot of direct light and they have done fine. You will also see these growing in the wild in direct light in places that are very tropical and they do fine there. So I don't agree that they can't tolerate direct light. Now, as always, make sure you're acclimating them when you bring them into your home, slowly moving them into brighter and brighter light. And if you do happen to see some stuff going on that might be a sign that it is too much light, then back them off. But a lot of the signs on this plant that I think people see and think it means it's too much light actually is something else going on. And I will explain those as we go along with some of the other care requirements in this video. But one thing to keep in mind is if you have a variegated version of this plant, such as Ruby here, or such as my Ficus Teneke, which is variegated very much in the same fashion as Ruby, as you can see, just doesn't have that Ruby-ish color to those leaves, but absolutely love this plant. And you can see there's a lot of white on those leaves, but we're not getting any kind of burn on them or anything from being in those southern facing windows. And the important thing to remember with the variegated varieties is if you're not getting them enough light, they're gonna start to lose that variegation. And even with the non-variegated variety, so there is what is called a burgundy ficus elastica with these deep, deep green leaves, very, very beautiful, same shape leaves as these ones, just that deeper, rich color. Even that plant wants a lot of light. And even though it's not variegated, if it doesn't get enough light, all of these plants have a tendency to start to drop leaves. So if you're starting to see leaves falling off of your ficus elasticas, the first thing I would check is, are they in enough light? Because that is one of the number one reasons they will pop those leaves off. The second reason they might pop those leaves off is due to overwatering. So let's go ahead and talk about watering. These plants like to dry out a bit between waterings. They are very prone to root rot. So you don't wanna be getting them too wet and you don't want them to be sitting in wet soil. I let mine dry almost all the way out, probably about at least three quarters of the way out before I go and water them again. I do know other people who say they let them go completely bone dry before they water them and that's worked for them. I get a little nervous about letting plants go completely bone dry that aren't succulents, but these leaves are very thick, waxy, almost kind of succulent like leaves. So a surefire way to know if your ficus elastica needs to be watered is these leaves will not only start to droop, but they will start to curl in on themselves. So they will start to point down 
and then they'll curl in like this. When you see leaves starting to do that on your ficus elastica, that usually means that you have underwatered it unless the soil feels wet. If the soil feels wet and you're seeing that, that's more of a sign that you might've overwatered it. But if that soil is definitely dry and those leaves are drooping and curling under, it is time to get out that watering can and give it a nice deep watering. Now, another way to know if you've overwatered your ficus elastica, especially if you have a variegated variety such as this, is you will start to notice browning on the leaf edges and the leaf tips. And usually that browning will be slightly soggy. It won't be crunchy. If it's crunchy browning, that is more of a sign of potentially underwatering or perhaps too much light. But brown that is soggy, that is definitely gonna be a sign of overwatering and eventually that leaf will drop. So since they are not fans of having wet feet, having them in well-draining soil is an absolute must. So when you're creating your soil mixtures for your ficus elastica, you wanna make sure you're adding in a significant amount of extra drainage in with your regular premium potting soil. Now it doesn't have to be too, too much. These are not an, like an aeroid or an aphytic type plant in any means at all. So I would say that you could do about three quarters of a premium potting mix to one quarter of extra drainage, such as your perlite or your pumice. That's gonna allow plenty of extra drainage when you're going to water that plant. Now, as far as temperature goes, these plants, they're from a very tropical type environment. They're used to higher temperatures. So they're gonna be fine with anywhere from 60 to say probably 85 degrees in your house. The thing you need to be more concerned about is making sure that they never drop below 55. That is that danger zone for most of your house plants and they will not do well below that temperature for very long. Now, if you're wondering about humidity for these plants, they're gonna do fine in pretty much any type of humidity in your home. I have had zero problems with them in regards to humidity any time of the year in my home. Now, as usual, we all know all plants would prefer slightly higher humidity, but the important thing with the ficus elastica to know is that you're not gonna get any kind of like really weird leaf things happening or drying up or crisping up or anything like that in any type of regular humidity that you're gonna have in your home. Now, as I said before, they are not the fastest of growers, but they're not the slowest of growers. So we'll just say they're moderately fast growers. And so for fertilization on these, my policy is the same policy I have with all my plants. As long as they're growing, I fertilize them once a month with a liquid fertilizer. And I would like to take a second here to kind of point out why I don't use the term growing season when I talk to you guys about fertilizing your plants. I think it's a little bit misleading. If these plants were living outside, then yes, 100%, you're gonna fertilize during the growing season in, and typically you, for these plants, you would have to back it off in the winter. However, when you bring them into your home, they don't necessarily know what season it is. And some of them that go dormant in the winter outside will continue to grow in your home during the winter. This plant supposedly will go dormant in the winter. Both of mine continue to put out new growth all winter long, not just in the growing season. So that's why I don't like to use the term growing season when talking to you guys about fertilizing because technically the growing season in my home for these plants is year round. Now, do they grow faster during the summer and the spring? Absolutely. They slowed down a little bit in the fall and winter, but honestly, it wasn't that much. So I continued year round to give these plants liquid fertilizer once a month and they do prefer I find a slightly higher nitrogen level when it comes to the fertilizer. So when we're talking about NPK fertilizer, and once again, NPK stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So when we're looking at the NPK for liquid fertilizers for these guys, we want something that's around like what I use is a 936. So you want that higher nitrogen level slightly lower on that phosphorus and then somewhere kind of in the middle on that potassium. Now, when it comes to fertilizers, if you really don't wanna to have to be buying different NPK numbers for all of your plants, you can get away with just a balance like a 999 or a 101010 10, 10 fertilizer for these guys. But if you really wanna give them that extra growing boost, then I would definitely go with that higher level nitrogen fertilizer. Now on the off chance that these plants do go dormant for you in your house in the winter and stop growing, then by all means back off your fertilization, wait till you're coming back around to spring to start picking it back up again. And same thing with watering. If you find that they're not growing as much in the winter or they completely stop growing for you at all in the winter, definitely back off your watering during that time as well. Now let's talk about my least favorite thing in the world, which is pests. Well, I have some good news for you. Typically, these plants are not highly prone to pests. They're pretty pest resistant. Now, as most of you who have been following me for a while will know, these did both get spider mites shortly after I did that notching video that I had mentioned before. However, the only reason they got spider mites was because my cat literally spread them to them from another plant. It's not like the spider mites just found them on their own or anything like that. So 
that was kind of a rare situation for these plants. But the two types of bugs that you're probably most likely going to see on here would be possibly those spider mites, but even more so than spider mites, mealybugs, because these are those very thick succulent like leaves that hold a lot of moisture in them and mealybugs love moist leaves. They love juicy leaves as it were. And the nice thing though is if you get mealybugs, these are huge broad leaves. So it's gonna be really easy for you to see them on these leaves and it's gonna be really easy for you to just remove them yourself with a little cotton swab with some rubbing alcohol on it, which you can just use to wipe them off and that will pretty much take care of it. But another thing to point out is that because these leaves are so big and so broad, they collect dust really easily and dust tends to attract pests. So you definitely wanna make sure you're cleaning these leaves off top and bottom just with a wet rag or running them under the faucet sprayer or spraying them down in your shower at least once a month to keep them nice and clean and help deter any pests from coming onto them. Now, as far as repotting goes with these guys, you're gonna wanna check them once a year and see if they're root bound. If they're root bound, then you do wanna repot them. You wanna take them up just one single pot size. And I do find that they tend to do better. Actually, you know, you guys, whenever I say a plant is prone to root rot, those plants tend to do better if you wait till they're pretty significantly root bound before moving them up to the next size pot, because now you've got roots that really want that extra soil, that extra space. If you move them up too soon and they're prone to root rot, now you've got extra soil that they don't necessarily need and you're increasing the chance for that root rot situation to happen. So definitely let them get pretty root bound before you move them up. And another way that you will be able to tell pretty easily if they might need to be repotted is that the roots will start to kind of track across the top of the soil and kind of like come up to where they're coming out of the dirt and trying to crawl almost out of the pot. That's another really good indicator on ficus elasticas that it's time to repot them. Now, when it comes to propagation on these plants, it's pretty much the same as it would be with any of your woody stemmed plants. You can propagate them in water. You could also propagate them directly to soil. I find that direct to soil is pretty easy. I have propagated a ruby ficus once from a branch cutting, and that's what you're gonna wanna do. You're gonna wanna find a relatively mature branch on your plant. You're gonna wanna cut it right below a node at a 45 degree angle. I would recommend making sure that you have at least four nodes on the section that you remove. Make sure it's probably about five inches long minimum. Now you're gonna wanna remove the lowest leaves on that branch, typically depending on how many leaves are on that branch. You definitely wanna leave the upper leaves on there as well as the new growth point at the very top of that branch. Now, I personally find, like I said, to go straight to soil to be the easiest thing. I do use rooting hormone when I do it. I just dip that stem into the rooting hormone and then stick it directly into the soil, give it a light water down, cover it with a plastic bag because I do find that increasing humidity when you're propagating these definitely helps. And then you're gonna set it in a bright indirect light place and you're gonna let it sit there. And in a few months, the roots will develop. And a little while after that, you'll start to see new leaf growth. And then after you have started to see more and more of those leaves come in, you can eventually uncover it and start to treat it just like a normal full grown ficus elastica. Now you can take that same branch cutting and just stick it directly in water. But I will let you guys know that in my experience with my woody stem plants, they take a lot longer to root in water than they do in soil. So I just prefer to go straight to soil because it's faster and it's relatively easy, like I said, with this plant. So that would be my recommendation. Now, since I did mention before that my cat Toby spread the spider mites to these plants, unfortunately, it seems like a good time to point out that these are actually toxic to pets. So you definitely do not wanna have these somewhere where your dog or your cat can get at them to chew on them if they are prone to chewing on plants. I am very fortunate that Toby has no interest in chewing on any of the plants, but they are a sap filled plant. So when you do go to take any kind of cutting off of them, you'll see a milky sap come out. That can be highly irritating to your skin as well, but it is definitely toxic to pets and children, small children, if they were to for some reason chew on your plant. So make sure if you do have kind of a situation where something like that might happen, that you have these up in a higher place where people or pets can't really get to them. But gorgeous, gorgeous house plants, absolutely love them. Can't wait 
for mine to get bigger and I will be doing a new notching video on these plants for you here soon. I'm gonna be trying an additional little step that I think is gonna help make that branching happen more quickly for you guys, but we'll see. We're gonna run a little experiment on it and I'm gonna film it all, including the results for you and put it all together in one video for you so you can see it from start to finish with those results. But I hope you guys have found this video helpful today. I hope if you don't have one of these plants and you've just gotten one that you find as much joy from them as I have. Let me know what kind of ficus elasticas you have experience with down below. And if you've not yet hit that like and or subscribe button down below, please do so. And I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Aloha.